unveiling the secrets of the book of Revelation, a journey into the heart of prophecy. Please step into the enigmatic realm of the book of Revelation, where visions of the future collide with profound truths about the human condition. This enigmatic text penned by the Apostle John on the desolate Isle of Patmos has ignited countless interpretations and fueled spiritual quests throughout history. Join us on a captivating journey as we unlock the secrets of Revelation, deciphering its cryptic language and unraveling its prophetic messages. Prepare to delve into the heart of prophecy, exploring the intricate symbolism that paints a vivid tapestry of hope, judgment and redemption. We will navigate through celestial battles, decipher the mysteries of the seven seals, trumpets and bowls, and encounter the enigmatic figures that populate this apocalyptic landscape. Embark on this extraordinary exploration and gain a deeper understanding of the ultimate destiny of humanity and the transformative power of faith in the face of adversity. And ever and ever. Amen. All right, we're continuing our um, commentary on the book of Revelation and God willing, if we are able to do by the grace of uh, God to finish chapter 15 this evening. So we'll read from Revelation 15 verses 5 to 8, which is the end of the chapter. Revelation 15 verses 5 to 8. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed, and all glory be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Okay, just a very brief introduction. Or, and just to reconnect and uh, revisit what we've been saying, um, and it's been a little while since we spoke about the book of Revelation. We said last time that chapter 15 is actually talking about the great tribulation that is focused on the Israelite nations of the end times. So the Jewish people in the Middle East, Israel. So it is the actual um, great tribulation and chapter 15 is an introduction to what we just read now about the seven golden bowls which are the wrath of God so it's talking about the seven golden bowls and if you can recall very briefly we said that when you read the book of Revelation you will see the number seven repeated quite often and we said there are seven seals seven trumpets and then seven bowls the seven seals are the promises of the lord the seven trumpets are the warnings of the lord and the seven bowls are the judgment of the war of the lord to mankind and to the israelite nation of the end times which is the 21st century unfortunately our century so now we're going to go into it and as we said, Revelation 15 is that intro to the great tribulation. We'll read from verse 5. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. There is a as if there is a contradiction in this particular verse, yet there isn't. But it says, and I saw the temple of the tabernacle in heaven opened. Now the temple is one thing and the tabernacle is another thing. The tabernacle, we see that in the wilderness, in the desert of Sinai, where the Israelite nation went in circle for 40 years. There was that tabernacle which the Lord God ordered Moses to build and put together. And that tabernacle was a tent, not a temple. 
Now the temple we see being erected once they reached the promised land, which is Jerusalem. When they reached the promised land, Jerusalem, that tent became a temple. That material kind of a building became brick and mortar, rocks. But in here, John the Beloved says, I saw the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. From this verse, we see the Lord is coming back once again to his people, Israel. Now the door being, uh, the temple being opened, the word opened means the beginning. You see, when you come to open the door, when you open that door, that opening is the beginning to I followed by a long way after opening the door. So opening the door here is talking about God revisiting his people Israel. Once again, he is going to go back and visit them to save them and bring them back home once and for all. And the temple, the tabernacle is to do with the Israelite nation, period. Nothing to do with the Christians. We don't have temples, we have church. Yes? So the language is pointing to the Israelite nation, the Jewish people. Now why John the Beloved is mentioning temple, tabernacle? Because he wants to say that God lived with the Israelite nation in both the tabernacle and the temple. He lived with them and was with them in both of them. The tabernacle in the wilderness of Sinai, 40 years. The temple in the promised land, Jerusalem. So God was with them in both. God was with them in both. I think I need to move on. I was going to say something else, but it's okay. No time. <laughs> Verse 6. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. Actually, this is what I was going to say. The Lord Jesus in his first coming, he came first to the Israelite people. But they rejected him. And when they rejected him then and then only he turned to the nations, to the non-Israelite people, which is us. Anyone who is not from the 12 tribes of Israel is called the pagan world, the non-Israelite nation, people who worship different false gods. And all of us, we worship different false gods. Our forefathers worshiped false gods. The only nation that worshiped the true divine God was the Israelite nation that was made out of 12 tribes. When the Lord came in his first coming, he went to the Israelite people. Why? Because he made a promise to our father Abraham that I will visit you and your descendant in the end of, uh, end of times. So that was a promise to Abraham. So when he came, the Lord went to the lost sheep of the uh, tribe of Israel, tribes of Israel. He even commanded and demanded from his 12 apostles. He said, do not go nowhere but to the lost sheep of the tribes of Israel, because I made a promise to Abraham I must fulfill. At the end of his ministry to them, they said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. We don't want him. So what happened? The door was shut in the face of the Israelite nation, the Jews. They shut it. So the door was opened to the pagan world, all of us. Lebanese with tabbouleh and the Italians with lasagna and pizza, the whole lot. Chinese, everyone. Everyone that is not an Israelite. The door was opened. He came to us. He established his church of, in the New Testament. And he called us from the world and brought us into his own kingdom, which is the kingdom of heaven on earth. 
and the second coming the door will be closed in our face and will be opened to the Israelite people that's why when you read in Romans 11:25 in Romans 11:25 St Paul is actually making reference to this he said um, blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in meaning the first coming of the Messiah a partial blindness happened to Israel in order for the Lord to turn his face and come to us why because he had to go to Israel imagine this if the Israelite people had accepted Jesus Christ we would have been all in hell so if anything thank the Jews for rejecting the Lord thank him yeah don't go against them thank them because my beloved they rejected the Lord but it's partial it's not full meaning it is only temporary they will be left alone aside until the Lord's second coming until the Lord's second coming he will go back to them but you see they had to reject him why because John 3 16 John 3 16 which is the heart the center of the entire Holy Bible and so God loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life who's gonna fulfill this verse God loved what the whole world not just the Jews not just Israel he loves the whole world and he gave his son as the sacrificial lamb of God as the salvific plan of God to the entire world so if the Jews had accepted him he couldn't have come to us because of the promise God made to Abraham the father of the Israelite nation in the Old Testament so when the Lord came he had to go to Israel not to us they rejected him thank God <laughs> so he had to, then he had to turn to us when he turned to us the door of grace was opened in the face of the New Testament church us when was the church born on Pentecost the 50th day when the Holy Spirit descended on those 120 people who were who had been gathered in that upper room like tongues of fire that's when the church of the new testament was born pentecost the 50th day from pentecost till the second coming of the messiah we are living in the time of grace but guess what the blindness to israel happened partially meaning the lord will go back to them it is only temporary so when he comes the second time the door will be shut in our face in order for the door to be opened in the Jewish or the Israelite nation's face when the door shuts in our face bye bye no more Lord no more mercy no more grace no more answering your request and prayers my advice to all of you my beloved all those who are watching as well I'm begging you don't ever say I don't have the time for the Lord don't ever say I don't have the time for the church don't ever say I don't have the time for his word don't ever say I don't have the time to be with God and for God because you will never appreciate what God has given you until the time comes where it's taken away from you you see we can only appreciate things when we lose them we take things so for granted I'll give an example I don't want to dwell on it won't have the time to finish chapter 15 you've got two legs two feet every day you get up so easily you walk so easily you run so easily have you ever thanked God for those two legs and those two feet no 
When will you beg God to give them back to you when he takes him away from you? You still got teeth in your mouth? You'll never appreciate that until you start having dentures. And the next time you forgot the dentures and the glass of water. You still got health? You'll never thank God until that health is taken away. How easy it is to come to church. A time will come, this privilege won't be available anymore. Thank God, while you've got it, don't make the Lord upset. Why are you going clubbing? Why are you going partying? It's the hell with this world. Come to the church and see the best looking bishop in the world. <laughs> With red belt in karate, what else do you want? The one who says, shame on you. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thank the Lord while you can. This is a gift. This is the grace of the Lord to you, my beloveds. He brought you to church, it wasn't you. He made it possible. How did he make it possible? His blood shed on Calvary on the cross. This price no one can afford to buy. This price no one can afford it. The price tag is beyond anyone's capacity and capability. The price to pay for the blood of the Lamb of God is beyond us all. But He did it. Why? One thing. L-O-V-E to all of you. I love you. I love you. That's why I died for you. Verse 6, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> and out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues. My goodness. Where did these angels come out of? The temple. What did they have? Seven plagues with them. So, the angels, the plagues came out of the temple. Of course, you know why? Because the Israelite nation... The only way for them to come back to the Lord is when they build the temple and get into the great tribulation. The problem of the Israelite nation of the end of times will be the temple. Why do you think there is so much struggles in Israel? Until now, there is this conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelites and the Jewish people. Why are they fighting? They're fighting for the land because there is one particular spot in that land where the temple will be re-erected once again. And that is the Mount of Moriah where currently stands the Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. I was going to say it in Arabic, Masjid Al-Aqsa. But Al-Aqsa Mosque. There are two sites that are extremely important to the Islamic world. Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque. Piece of information. Did you know the Architects between, uh, behind the Dome of the Rock are Christians. Eighth century, Byzantine era. Christians designed the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> We're not bad, man. <laughs> there is the Dome of the Rock and Al Aqsa Mosque on that Temple Mount. And the Jewish want to build their temple. And if they don't build it, there is no forgiveness of sins. Because without a temple, there is no altar. Without an altar, there is no animal sacrifices. And without animal sacrifices and the sprinkling of the blood of those animals on the people of the Israelite nation, there is no forgiveness of sins. So since 70 AD till now, the Jews 
wish to have a temple there and have an altar and offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of their sins. They haven't managed to do that yet. That's why there are struggles between the Arab world, the Palestinians and the, and the Jews. Otherwise, what are they fighting for? What are you fighting for? It's the Temple Mount. That's the whole problem. That's the whole dilemma. The Temple. And the Temple will be the cause of the Great Tribulation for the Jews. Because when they build it, and they will, by the way, they will. When they build it, again, they'll erect an altar. They'll bring animals, slain them, offer them as sacrifices like their forefathers did in the Old Testament. And they, they will sprinkle that blood for the forgiveness of people's sins. There is no greater blasphemy against God the Father than this one. For someone to come after the blood of his beloved son that was shed on Calvary to bring an animal and says this animal's blood is for the remission of sins of people. This is the greatest blasphemy against God. God will get so angry, they will enter the great tribulation and they will be squashed by the Almighty God and then, and then only they will say, have mercy on us, son of David, have mercy on us. We have wronged you, we crucified you, we denied you, but today we confess you are the Savior, you are the Lord, you are our God. Come and save us. But it will take a great tribulation for the Jews to come back to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Middle Eastern normally, naturally, are stubborn people. The Jews, they top everyone because they descend from the Assyrians. I'm Assyrian. <laughs> we can be very stubborn people. So Middle Eastern, they have that in them. Very difficult. When they say no, no, that's it. Don't bother wasting your time anymore. So it will take a great tribulation for the Jews to come back to the Lord Jesus. That's why these seven angels having seven plagues they came out of the temple because it is all got to do with the temple the dilemma the problem of the israel uh, of the israelite nation is the temple they want to re-erect it once again but they will not realize once they erect the temple this is for all of you my beloved when the temple is built remember world war three is knocking at the doors and the door of grace and mercy is shut in the face of the church. And World War III will start. And the beginning to World War III, Israel will be striked by a superpower and definitely not America. Because America will not be that superpower when the time comes. Will not. Will not be. There is another superpower. That will say to Israel, hello, ha, and then turn against Israel and strike Israel. And that's the nuclear weapon when it's going to be used, World War III. And what is the Great Tribulation? World War III. Because World War III will cover the whole globe. Everyone who's got that kind of weapon will hit the button. You'll see rockets flying everywhere. Um, the first present to Australia will be from China. <laughs> uh, Mr. Prime Minister, ah, that's for you too. Ni hao. Ho ho. No more ho ho. It will be ow oh, ow. Oh. <laughs> so the first rocket will come. Man, you can go to Ezrock. <laughs> you want to go, I don't know, whatever you want to hide. I ain't gonna hide, baby, when the, rock, when the rocket hits <laughs> the, the ground of Australia. There won't be any hiding. The temple has to be built again. That's one of the prophecies must be fulfilled in the land of Israel. 
Um, okay, so they will come out of the temple, seven angels having seven plagues. These angels are clothed in pure bright linen. Pure bright linen. What pure? Righteousness. Bright glory. So they are dressed, the angels are dressed with righteousness and glory. And what do they have? And having their chests girded with golden bands. In chapter 1 of Revelation, we saw the Lord Jesus girded with a band around his chest. So in other words, the angels are dressed up like the Lord. They dressed up with righteousness and glory. Purity, righteousness. Brightness, light is glory. The Lord was dressed up in white when he rose from the dead. Now white is purity, righteous. He is the righteous one. And he is all light. He is the glory of heaven and earth and everything that exists. He is the glory. So their chests are girded with golden bands. A band in a simple language, English, belt. When you put on the belt and you tie that belt, what does that say to you and me? I am ready to go out. Yes? Come on, Matt. I tied my belt now. I'm ready. I'm ready to go to work. I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to go out. So they had these bands, golden bands, tied around their chest. Now, why chest? Because in that chest area, inside, there is something called the heart. There is something called the heart. These seven angels came out of the temple with seven plagues in their hands. They are dressed up in purity, righteousness, in light, glory, and stripped, strapped, a band strapped around their chest, and it's a golden one. Now a golden band, meaning golden means never changes, because gold is the only substance that never changes. You put a piece of metal outside, after a little while, you'll see it rusting. But the gold protects and preserves its value, no matter how old it becomes. The older it becomes, the more expensive it is. Gold never changes, meaning whatever is going to happen, this will not change. It's going to happen. It is going to happen 100%. Now, these angels, the seven, came out of the temple with seven plagues. Plagues are punishments. Punishments. Now, they had the band, they were girded around their chest with these bands, golden bands. Now the chest refers here to the heart. The heart, biblically speaking, speaks of your conscience. What is the role of the angels in the end of times? They will come to awaken the dead, sleepy conscience of people. They will come and shake you from inside, not outside. They will shake you from inside. So God's punishment, God's warning to humanity in the end of times will be the awakening of our sleepy conscience. How many millions now as we speak their conscience has been put to sleep. My goodness. They don't care anymore. They kill people as if they've done nothing. They've destroyed things as if nothing has happened. They've done whatever they wanted, regardless what the outcome was, how many people I've hurt, what I've done against God. Who cares about God? Who cares about people? All I care about is me. Why? Why am I living this way? Because my conscience, I've put it to sleep. And I wish I had the time to speak about the conscience. So important. 
But I'll take you with me on a little journey all the way to the beginning of things. When our father Adam and Eve had their two sons, Cain and Abel. God came to Cain. He said, where is your brother? God knows that Cain had already killed his brother Abel. He said, where is your brother? Cain said, what do you see me, God? Am I the protector of my brother? Find someone else. Why are you asking me, where is Abel? I don't know. Yet he had killed him. How come Cain was able to kill his brother? The only way, please pay attention, the only way for Cain to be able to kill his brother, for him to be able to kill his conscience. The moment we switch off our consciences, expect every evil thing coming out of us. Every evil thing. The moment our consciences are dead, are sleeping. So the angels roll in the end of times, they will come, their chests are, are girded with, with golden bands. Go, the chest here refers to the heart, the conscience. Their role is to come and shake the conscience and awaken people's consciences and say, what are you doing? Please repent, repent, repent. The wrath of God is coming upon you so heavily. None like it. For all the centuries that have gone by, what will happen in the 21st century surpasses all other centuries put together. Surpasses, my beloved. There will be plagues. Verse seven. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden balls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. One of the four living creatures. Who can remember who are the four living creatures that we spoke of previously? Well done. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The four living creatures are the four gospels. We see that in Revelation 4, 7, and we see that in Ezekiel 1, 10. So, the four living creatures are the four Gospels. So, one of the four Gospel writers gave to those seven angels the seven golden balls, which are the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. God's wrath. One of the living creatures. Who would that be, that one of those living creatures? More than likely, it is Matthew, the gospel writer. Why Matthew? Because Saint Matthew, in his gospel, chapter 24, he talks what will happen in the end of times. When you read Matthew 24, Saint Matthew is talking about wars happening everywhere, floods happening everywhere, plagues, viruses. Oh, what was that virus that came uh, just uh, the other day? Oh, what a feeling, Corona. <laughs> corona, Habibi. Corona came, that is a plague. Didn't it engulf the whole world? It did. Put everyone at lockdowns. We experienced it, we lived it for just over two years. One day I'm out, one day I'm in. One day I can only go five kilometers away from the house. And I'm gonna get a Tommy gun one of those days. <laughs> we went through plagues. St. Matthew talks about it very and very detailed. What will happen? There will be famine everywhere. There will be plagues everywhere. Earthquakes everywhere, whether natural or man-made. Yes, nowadays they can make earthquakes happen unnaturally. Man-made, you would think that it was natural. Who can prove it? No one. They're all evildoers. Climate change that causes uncertain 
um, in certain areas where it had never rained, they can bring floods. And places that rains all the time, they can make it go dry. Climate change. My goodness. Natural disasters. Yet they are not natural. They are man-made. But behind all this, why has humanity been able to do all this evilness? Because God is angry. It's the wrath of God. That's why he's allowing them. Nothing happens without God's approval. Even those who do not believe in God and think they are doing it themselves and they're getting away with it. They're not realizing they are fulfilling the plan of God. Everything is running according to what Jesus Christ wants. Not what he wants, but his will. Because he knew the Lord in the end, humanity will walk away from him. Humanity will deny him. When we deny God, don't ever expect to live happily ever after. Don't ever expect to live freely ever after. Don't ever expect you're going to prosper. Whatever you'll do, at the end, the price will be beyond what you're capable of. The only time I and you, you and I are happy, healthy, prosperous, when Jesus Christ is our King, our Lord, our Savior, our God, period. Please, I beg you, going out, having fun, doing things, that's not life. That's not freedom. To my beloved young men and women, especially those who are still teenagers and early 20s and even 30s, I'm begging you. Most of my life, I lived in Australia. Most of my life. I come from the Middle East, but most of my life, I lived here in Australia. I know what it feels like to be a teenager here because I was one of them. I know what it feels like when you're in your 20s and you're so ambitious and you've got all the freedom right before your very eyes and you can do whatever, go wherever, with whom you want to go. It's a free country, brother. Even if you want to change your shape and you want to call yourself an it, it's a free country. It's a free country. But listen. No one, no one escapes God's judgment. No one. Go and have fun according to your understanding and definition. But before you know it, you'll have to answer to everything you've done. Believe me, take it from me. Don't try it because you may not be able to come back from it. Why you want to learn the hard way? Learn the easy way. You cannot do it. God is watching. God is justice. God is almighty. God is in control. These little puppets that they think they are doing whatever, God is laughing. God is laughing at them. They're fulfilling his plan without knowing it. These fools. Because if you're an adult and act wildly, then you're a fool. The plagues, the golden, the golden balls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. My goodness. Now someone will ask me, what is the wrath of God? Does God get angry? I mean like he's going to boil up? like a volcano about to erupt, and when he erupts, he comes and punches me and kicks me and then chop my head. No, we do that. God doesn't do that. So what is the wrath of God? You see, when we get angry, we lose it, don't we? Oh man, everything goes blank. The mouth opens, the brain seizes. And then after you wake up, you say, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Ash on your head. That's an Assyrian expression. Ash on your head. Um, but when we get angry, we lose it. 
We don't know what we're saying, what we're doing, where we're going. It's finished, gone. God never loses it. God is always in control. God is always cool, calm, and collected, even when he's angry. Because he's God. Nothing boils his blood up. You can't say a word to God and make him lose it. He cannot. He's perfect. He's in control. So what is the wrath of God? Even when he comes to punish, he does it with love. Now what is the wrath of God? I'll, I'll give you an example. Imagine I've been put in this room for two months, absolutely dark. No window, no crack in it, no a glimpse of light reaching that room. Fully sealed, absolutely pitch black dark. Two months, never seen the light. And then after two months, someone comes with a mag big projector and directs it at my eyes. I lose it. And when I lose it, what do I do? I blame the one who had the light in his hand. And I say, it's all your fault. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been angry. This is the wrath of God. He is light coming to shine on people that chose to live in absolute darkness. When the light shined upon them, they blamed God instead of thanking him. You know why God, even with his punishment, he punishes with love? Because he is daddy. He is the father. I ask you parents, even when you punish your children, do you punish them out of hatred or out of love? When a father smacks physically, smacks his son, the son gets upset and gets hurt. Maybe for a day, for a week, for a month, the son forgets, but the father all his life will never forget that one day he smacked his son. He never. Why? Because the father is all love for his child. When he smacked his son, he smacked himself a million times moreover. Because I never ever want, wish to punish you, my son, but you left me no choice. I tried everything under the sun to warn you, to say to you what you're doing is wrong, who you're mixing with is wrong. Come back, my son, stop living in this way. It's gonna destroy you, my son. You left me no choice but to raise my hand and smack you across the face, hoping that you're gonna wake up to what you are doing because you are absolutely blind, my son. So when I smacked you, I cried, not you. Because I'm dead. I don't want to hurt my child. He's my life. How much more our Heavenly Father wants to punish us? No. The punishment, the wrath of God, is us going angry at Him. Why are you shining your light on me? Take it away. I love darkness. But darkness will take you to hell. Sin will take you to hell. Come back to the light. Be in the glory of your heavenly Father. Be in that glory. Be in that glory, my child. Verse eight, finish it off. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Now I'll tell you one thing, I ask you one thing. What has God's smoke to do with glory? Imagine this, if, if, if you get put in a place and they shut the door and there's only smoke coming out in that place, what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna suffocate, isn't it? So what glory is there in a place that is all filled with smoke. You're choking, there is no oxygen. You're gonna start, you're gonna start choking, you're gonna start suffocating. Eventually, if they don't get me out of there, I'm gonna die. So what glory is there? He says, no, the temple was filled with smoke, which is the glory 
from the glory and the power of God. My goodness. You see, when God comes to enter a person's life, that person rejects God. Do you know why? He rejects God because when God entered their life, they started suffocating. Like the smoke suffocates you, so as God began to suffocate you. What do I mean by this? You see, why do people, some people, they don't wish to come to God? Why? It's not that there is something wrong with God. Far from Him. He is all love, the perfect, ever living God. But the problem is, those people do not wish to change and come to God the way God wants them to live. When I went to church the first time, and it was the last time, I heard the bishop saying, the Lord Jesus approves of this and disapproves of this. When I heard the word of God, that word of God that entered me, suffocated me like the smoke, because the word said, you can't do this, yet I'm doing it. You can't say this, yet I'm saying it. You can't, you can't, you can't. So what happened? I don't want to go to God because God is nothing but a smoke that suffocates me. I don't want to give up on my pleasures. I don't want to give up on drugs. I don't want to give up on women. I don't want to give up on gambling. I don't want to give up on nakedness. I don't want to give up on killing. I don't want to give up on stealing. I don't want to give up. When I go to God, He'll say, you cannot do these things. He is choking me. Therefore, God, you don't exist so that I can be free and be able to breathe. But without realizing, the only source of life is God. When you walk away from Him, you're taking carbon dioxide, not oxygen. Eventually you will die. My son, you chased after drugs. What was your end? Either being killed or prison. You destroyed your life. You destroyed your future. You destroyed your health. You destroyed yourself. Completely gone. You chased the lust of this world. Where are you? You chased the fame of this world. Where are you? You chased the pleasures of this world. Where are you, my son, my daughter? Where are you? Please look at other people, how they lived and how they ended up. Learn from them. Learn from them. So many people came from a very humble lifestyle and one day they became famous and rich. When they were humble, they were churchgoers. When they became famous and rich, they were evildoers. Evildoers. Fame destroyed them, money destroyed them, prestigious life destroyed them. It destroyed them. Destroyed them. So that's why God is smoke. He's suffocating me. I want to be free. I don't want anyone to tell me you cannot do this. You cannot say this. You cannot dress up like this. You need to get off my case. I will dress up the way I wish, the way I want to say things, the way I want to live. No one tells me anything. This is Australia. And well done to such evil doers governments giving such dangerous freedoms to little kids it's a shame there is no one government on the face of this planet that has the right to impose a certain lifestyle on people because government did not create those people in order to give them the order how to live only God can a government is placed by God when it protects the very freedom 
the values and the morals of what a human is supposed to be a human. Then I'll call this government is from God. But when the government destroys values, morals, ethics, faith, then it comes from Satan. Period. It comes from the evil one. So when someone comes and calls himself a Christian and says, the Holy Bible says governments are from God, don't ever speak half the truth because you are son of a snake. Continue the verse and speak the whole truth, not half the truth. The government is from God when the government does the will of God, not Satan. Very simple. Yet Christian leaders said, you need to adhere to the governments because the Holy Bible says the governments are from God. Man, if I grab you with my hands. See those cartoons, you know, like uh, Donald Duck. <laughs> and then I'll buy them a fish burger and a chocolate sundae. <laughs> oh, my goodness. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. Do not suffocate when you receive the word of God. Take it as your life, the source of life. Take it as your oxygen, which you live on and you are in need of. Listen to the word of God because it's the only way. It's the only way to your salvation. It's the only way. I'll put this here. It's the only way to your salvation. The word. Listen to the Lord. Don't ever listen to Satan. Don't ever listen to the world. Listen to the Lord. So I was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Meaning... No one was able to enter the temple. No Jewish person will ever be able to come back to the Lord until the seven plagues are completed. Until they get the punishment they deserve for their stubbornness and still saying till this day the Messiah hasn't come yet. Until they say and proclaim that Jesus Christ has come, he is the true Messiah and there is no one else but him. Until that day comes, all the plagues must be completed upon the Israelite nation and the entire world with them, my beloved. In Psalm 119 verse 105 Psalm 119 verse 105 King David is saying your word he's speaking to the Lord your word is like a lamp to my path to my feet a light to my way or to my path your word Lord is like a lamp to my feet a light to my way your word is light your word is light, my Lord. It is not smoke. But do you know when the word suffocates me? When I don't have that oil in that lamp. You see, when you read in Matthew chapter 25, the Lord Jesus gave this parable about the ten virgins. Five wise, five unwise. Ten virgins, five wise, five unwise. The foolish ones, the unwise, they took their lamp, but they did not take oil with them. They took the lamp, but no oil with them. But the wise ones, they took oil in their vessels with their lamps. See, when you read the Holy Bible, you need to understand the language of the Holy Bible. The fools took the lamps, no oil. But listen, the wise, how the Holy Bible speaks about the wise. They said they took oil in their vessels, not in their lamps. In their vessels with their lamps. Wow. But the fools took lamps only, no oil. No mention of vessel for the fools. But there is a vessel for the wise. The lamp, Psalm 119, 105 says is the word of God. Your word is the lamp. 
So you see how the Bible, the Holy Bible explains it, uh, itself by itself? So the lamp, we understand it's the word of God. Now, if the lamp is the word of God and you take it with no oil, what is oil here? Holy Spirit. Now, the, the, the foolish ones, they took the lamp with no oil, meaning they took the word of God without the Holy Spirit. When you take, when you receive the word of God without the Holy Spirit, it is nothing but smoke. You will suffocate. But you see, when you become wise, what do you take? You take oil in your vessel, not the lamp. The lamp is the word, and the word is spirit. But who needs the oil? Me and you. So what is the vessel? Our bodies. Our bodies is the vessel. We need to take oil in our bodies. The oil is the Holy Spirit. When we get filled by the Holy Spirit, the Word of God will light up and becomes light instead of smoke. When you light up a lamp without oil, only smoke will come out, no light. And the smoke will suffocate you. So when you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, filled, filling you, when you receive the Word, when you hear the Word, when you read the Word, you'll start yawning, you'll fall asleep, you'll say, this is not for me. You'll run away. Because you haven't been filled by the Holy Spirit. And to be filled by the Holy Spirit, you need to love the Lord Jesus. You can't live in the world and expect God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. You can't run away from Jesus Christ and do everything against Him and expect God to fill you with His Holy Spirit. Therefore, when you are living in the world, when you hear the Word of God, it is suffocating. It's smoke because you've lit the lamp with that oil. You know, in the good olden days, there was that piece of string and it used to be dipped in oil all the time. The moment oil finished, that string gave smoke. But as long as it's enriched by the oil, there is light, there is beauty. So when the word is lit up in me without the Holy Spirit, which is the oil, smoke will come out. This word is against me. I can't stand Jesus. I don't want to do nothing with Jesus. I'm running away, man. Jesus is too much. Don't go out half naked. What do you mean don't go out half naked? I want to go out half naked. But Jesus says you cannot do that. Don't change your face. But I want to change my face. I want to look like a fish. <laughs> so Jesus is suffocating me. Don't go out and have fun. But I want to have fun. So you see Jesus is standing against me. He's a stumbling stone. But when you get filled by his Holy Spirit, Jesus is light. What is light? Glory. Glory, my beloved. Wow. Next time you walk filled by the Holy Spirit, you will see the Lord, the beauty of existence. You will see the Lord, the glory of existence. You will see the Lord, the only way, the only truth, and the only life. You will see Jesus, the only one that I need in my life, and I don't need anyone else but Him. He suffices. He suffices. Oh yes, He suffices. Let Jesus lead your way. Let Jesus show you the way. I beg you, I beg you, my beautiful daughters and sons, let Jesus show you the way. Every day, very simple thing, it doesn't take a huge effort to get Jesus' attention. But it takes one thing, to get the Lord's attention, the heart, the, 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 the heartbeat. When you genuinely are seeking Him from the heart, He's always there for you. You don't need to go to Him because He will come to you. You see, the Lord speaks the language of love, not gibberish, the language of love. The Lord speaks the language of love. 
The language of love comes from the heart, not the lips. Because the lips, they twist and falsify things. The heart cannot lie. Whatever way you are feeling inside of you, there is no two ways about it. This is it. So if you're feeling upset, you'll reveal it. If you're feeling angry, the heart reveals. The heart can't hide, can't lie, can't falsify. Cannot. The Lord wants the heart. Even if it's full of darkness, of spider webs, of vengeance, of anger, of pride, of envy, of jealousy, He wants your heart as it is. He just wants it. Don't try to fix it. You cannot. I've heard so many times people say, I'm trying to go to church, but I don't have the time now. I'm busy. When I get the time, I will go. You will never come. It is not you who make the time to go to the Lord. It is the Lord who makes the time for you to come to Him. You need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, make the time for me to come and be with you. You need to ask Him. It is the Lord's doing, none of yours. Trust me. Trust the Word of God. It is the Lord's doing. Give Him your heart as it is. Say, Lord, I'm this and this and this and this and this. Take this heart that has given me nothing but pain, nothing but agony, nothing but trouble. Take it away, Lord. Give me your heart because yours is sacred. Yours is holy. Yours is perfect. Take my heart and give me yours. Let me be you. And you be me. Give him your heart. When you give him your heart and allow him to fill you with his Holy Spirit, with his Holy Presence, the next time you hear his word, it'll be light, it'll be glory, it'll be everything that is beautiful. Everything that is beautiful. Ask the Lord. Not bad. <laughs> No, it's a bit hot, isn't it? I know I'll be finished very shortly in another 10 hours. <laughs> My beloveds, what has been happening in the world and what is happening till this very day is very ugly, very evil, very stupid. It's absolutely foolish to think that you can rule the world. Absolutely foolishness. This has never happened, never will. No one will ever be able to rule the world. No one. Because no one can stop death. No one. I don't care who they are, what they are, and what they say, and what they promise, you are a liar. Because life and death comes from God. Life came from the source called God, and it is God who ordered death to conquer humans when they break His word. Who ordered death to wake up? God. Because He said to Adam, the day you break my word, you shall die. So who commanded death to rise? God. When? When we break his word. When we go against him. So what God does, no one can stop. No one can change. Period. They can go to Mars, to Jupiter. They can build a space station 
Elon Musk, a piece of advice, my dear friend, why are you wasting all those billions on these rockets trying to prove that you are some sort of a genius? Right? Give me those billions. There are millions of people starving in Africa and worldwide. Let us put this money to good use. What is the use of this rocket? What are you doing? Unbelievable. I remember when I was a little kid back in Iraq. Man, when those neighbors came out, each from their houses, and sat at the front door, and all the neighbors came and gathered around, there was no formal invitation. <laughs> there was no hubby, you have to buy me a $2,000 dress, <laughs> and, I, I, and, and I have to be better looking than the bride. <laughs> There was none of that. They all came in their humble, simple outfit. Ready, not ready, who cares? Invited, not invited. It's an open invitation. Whether you are invited or not, you're already invited. They came in so simplistic way, so humble way, but when they sat together, it was absolutely priceless. Because when they laughed, it came from the bottom of their heart. Like they meant it. They lived it. They tasted it. It came through every single fiber of their, of their, of their body. That laughter was genuine. Those words were genuine. Those smiles were genuine. Those facial expressions were genuine. Those eyes focused on you were genuine. Today, people are going and coming with no genuineness. No genuineness. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Fake. I just acted. Fake. And the moment I walked, I said, mm. She had to come in my way. She ruined my day. But you just said, hi. <laughs> So what was the ha 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 for? It was hoo hoo hoo. I meant to say blue, 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 but I couldn't, so I acted. <laughs> Don't act. Don't act. I'm not saying go against anyone. I won't tell you that. I, I will never say hate anyone because that doesn't exist in the Christian index. But if you see someone that is not so much loved by you, tell them. Don't fake it. Say, listen. I don't want to say hello. You know why? Because I don't like your face. Maybe they love you more than acting before them and behind their backs, you are a stabbing knife. We need to be genuine. Genuine. But we need to love one another. For this is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All glory to his holy and mighty name, the crown of my head, my Jesus, the love of my life, the one and only. Man, I adore this man. Yes, I get angry with him. Yes, I get upset with him. Yes, I tell him off my way sometimes, but I adore him to death. He knows that. He knows. That's why he is tolerant with me. Because even though I am pain in his neck, but he knows I love him. That's why when I act childishly, he comes and grabs me and says, man, I love you. Because he knows. He knows. He knows. Love the Lord. Just give him your heart. When you go on your knees and you talk to him, just be you. Don't ever act. He knows. Don't ever fake things. He knows. Don't try, don't ever try to be someone else you are, which is not you. Be you. With my filth, with what, whatever I have, I go as I am. I go as I am. And I say, Lord, 
even though your word is like a sword on my neck even though your word is suffocating me where I want to do things my way but your word is stopping me but I will choose your word over my word any time of the day any time of the day I will choose your word over my word any time of the day even if it destroys me even if it suffocates me even if it kills me even if it breaks me let your will be done in me as it is done in heaven in your angels don't worry about my cries my whinging my complaining my jumping up and down my bashing my head on this wall on that wall don't worry ignore it do as you please lord because i want to be with you in the end i want to be with you i want to be with you break me as long as you make me this is the way we need to embrace the word of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's not a story to be told. It's not a song to be sang. It's a life that must be lived. Must be lived. Must be lived. So, to leave you with this, every morning you wake up, trust me, do this. Okay? You will see how things will start changing. Every morning you wake up, Say, Lord, hello. I love you, brother. I love you, Lord. I love you, my God. I love you, my Savior. I love you, my Good Shepherd. I love you, my honey. I love you, my sweetie. I love you, my, my crown of glory. I love you, my King. I love you, my Savior. I love you. You are nothing but to be loved. So, good morning. In fact, it's not only good morning, you are the morning and you are the good God who is my morning. Thank you for giving me you who is the morning to me. You are the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness. Your day never sees darkness because the sun never goes down for the sun is Christ. So, May your morning be blessed upon me. Secondly, Lord, all I want to say with my humble, with my piece of wreck, and I hope and I pray that you accept this. I love you, Lord. Your will be done in my life this morning, this day. Do as you please. But please don't forget to give me a Ferrari as well. He will. <laughs> but talk to him, love him, and spoil him. How many people do we spoil in our life? When the boy loves the girl. Hala, 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 hala. They just went out for five hours. The moment he got through the front door of his house and she went to her house, he picks up the phone and calls her. Honey, ya habibi. You have no idea how much I've already missed you. Liar. <laughs> she was in your face for five hours, brother. You just walked through the front door. But no, because I love her. I miss you. And then she said, oh. <laughs> Now that is so cute. And then she starts playing with her hair. After marriage. Honey, shut up. With the Lord, it has to be always kindled. That love to be kindled. Always af afresh, always anew. So he got up in the morning and say, I'm, I'm pinching you from your cheeks. Goody, goody to you, Lord Jesus. You are my baby. You are my beautiful. I love you. I adore you. Dad, I just want to express my love to you as a little baby. I don't want to be an adult. When it comes to love and show you the love, 
don't ever let me to be an adult because at, between adults the love is kind of boring I want to be that baby crying to you <laughs> don't go without me don't go without me you know has to be 7.30 anyway <laughs> you know when the Lord Jesus says unless you come back and be like a little child you cannot enter the kingdom of God in here he's not talking about being wise because as to be to have wisdom he wants you to be an adult mature but he wants you to be an innocent like that child that child the Lord is saying I want you to be like a child in what way number one he says the child knows without mom and dad they are dead who changes them mom and dad who feeds them mom and dad who clothes them mom and dad who takes them to the doctor when they are sick mom and dad who looks after them mom and dad do they rely 99.999 on their mom and dad no they rely on them 100 percent he says to all of us when you come to me are you like that child saying to your heavenly dad without you i'm dead lord or are you saying I can do some things without you, but some I cannot. It's either all or none. When you come to the Lord, it's either all Him or nothing. Jesus can't take a percentage. He needs to take all the hundred percent. So come to Him as a child and say, without you, I am filthy. My nappy is full. I've stuffed up. I sinned. I sinned the moment I walked away from you. I'm filthy, I'm dirty. Daddy clean me. Daddy wash me. Daddy change me. Daddy make me wholesome once again. Daddy washed me clean with his precious blood. What a dad. What a dad. The baby. When mom or dad leaves the room and leaves that baby behind, it's World War III. They start crying, they start jumping up and down, breaking things. You do not, how dare you leave the room without me? How dare you leave the house without me? They cry, cry, cry until dad or mom comes and picks up the baby and says, oh, I'm sorry, darling, let's go. <laughs> you do the same. Say, Lord, daddy, don't ever leave without me. I'm a baby. I need to be with my dad. I cry when dad leaves. I lose it when dad leaves. I go haywire, nuts crazy when dad leaves. Don't ever leave. I'll go with you. Be like a baby, the Lord says. When the, the father takes that baby, the baby never questions the dad. Where are we going? Who are we meeting? How long are we going to be? When are we coming back? When that baby becomes an adult, it is the same dad that comes to the same child who is an adult now. And the same dad says to his son who is an adult, son, let's go. The son says, where are we going? How long are you going to be? When are you coming back? Sorry, dad, I don't have the time for you. How come you had all the time for me when you were a baby? How come now, as an adult, you don't have the time for the same dad? Dad never changed. You changed, my child. You changed. Dad, I want to be that child even if I'm a hundred year old. Full of wisdom. I want to be your baby in nappy. You take me to hell, I don't care. You take me to heaven, I don't care. You take me wherever, as long as you take me. I want to be with you. The place matters not, as long as I'm with the owner of the place. With the owner. This kind of an intention you need to have when it comes to Jesus. Don't treat him as an obligation or a duty. Treat him as your life, for he is. He is your life. God bless you. This is the word of God. This is the Lord. Your life. Live him. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, just, a couple, uh, just a reminder before we uh, call it a day. Actually, I'll ask my beloved Nora for another hymn. 
Let's hear another hymn. Um, just a reminder before we call it a day um, or an evening. <laughs> Uh, when we go out, please just try and be as uh, quiet as possible and um, respecting the, uh, the surrounding neighbors to your cars and then um, leave the uh, car park area uh, with, um, uh, with the easiest way and quietest way possible, please. Um, don't forget about the, um, the Good Shepherd Youth Ministry. Anyone who is 18 plus, if you haven't joined, you still have the time to join our youth ministry. Um, we have currently a monthly meetings and then in the very near future, God willing, we will start having some activities, spiritual activities. And also, uh, there will be also some biblical teachings as well in, when we get together. So if you'd like to be equipped more and more with, by, with the word of God, I encourage you to join our youth ministry, the Good Shepherd Youth Ministry. Uh, if you're 18 plus. We have been making an exception at the ages of 17. In some cases, there's not a, a great deal of a difference, I guess. So if you're, uh, you know, 17 or 16 and smart like the bishop, <laughs> uh, you, can, uh, you can come and, um, and ask and hopefully we will accept you as well. Uh, so we want to see our youth coming together. Um, we need to build uh, a very strong base and foundation. I'm encouraging you, my beloved youngsters, um, 18 plus, come, let us join in this youth ministry. We want to see people of prayer. We need to see people praying more. We need prayer. You want to change things? Pray. You want to improve in your life? Pray. You want God to be more vividly clear in your life? Pray, my beloved. So with this youth ministry, there is so many things we want to do for the glory of Christ. And one of it is definitely a prayer. We need to establish a group, prayer, uh, a group of prayer. This group, all they do is just pray. Pray for the church. Pray for clergymen. Pray, pray for the unity of the church. Pray for their peace in the world. And pray for this evilness to be decimated by the almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So please, come and join the youth ministry. This is one of the things, but there are so many other things that we need to do. And God willing, we will be doing very soon. So I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to these monthly meetings at the present time. They probably go more regularly later on, but at this present time, we have just started, so I haven't missed out on anything. So if you haven't joined, please join the youth ministry. See the youth group committee and enroll. Put your name down. Um, the other thing is, I love you, but the Lord Jesus loves you the most. Um, again, a reminder about these Facebooks with these uh, false accounts that have been opened under this bishop's name. Um, Apparently now, it's not only Facebook, there is Instagram as well. Um, so they're, they're doing all right, these people. <laughs> so if you see anything under Bishop Mari, Marmari, whatever, personal name, I don't have any personal accounts on social media platforms, never had, never will. So if you see any social media platforms under my personal name, it's fake, report it, and inform and alert other people that you know, alert them, not to fall into that trap. I will never do that. They're, they're sending messages as if it's coming from me and asking for donations for money. That is not my style. When I ask, I ask for a million dollars and above. So don't worry. <laughs> so it's not me, okay? <laughs> That's not my style. So please um, report them and alert other people not to fall into that trap. Let's stand for the finale prayer, please. In conclusion, the book of Revelation provides a vivid and awe-inspiring account of the end times, painting a canvas of both judgment and salvation. Through its enigmatic symbolism and prophetic visions, it unveils the cataclysmic events that will culminate in the ultimate victory of God's kingdom. While its imagery may be challenging to decipher, its central message remains clear the forces of evil will be vanquished and those who remain faithful will inherit eternal life. The book of Revelation serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of sin 
and the imperative to choose righteousness, offering a beacon of hope amidst the trials and tribulations of the world.